All right, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Today, Google Chicago is excited to welcome the cast of Superior Donuts, which is a comedy on CBS about the owner of a small donut shop in a quickly gentrifying neighborhood that takes place right here in Chicago. You'll recognize the cast and crew here today from many of the TV shows and movies. They're also a very uh, talented group of stand-up comedians and are in the middle of a Coast to Coast stand-up comedy tour. They're going to be performing at Zany's tonight. And tonight also marks the season two premiere of their show, Superior Donuts, which you can check out at 8 o'clock on CBS. So please join me in welcoming Maz Jabrani, Jermaine Fowler, David Koechner, and Rel Battle. That's right, motherfuckers! <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon. Great crowd. Thanks for coming out, man. I really packed it out. Thank y'all so much. Really packed it out. Too many people. I'm a little nervous now. (laughs) Well, thank all you guys for coming out this evening. Appreciate you for being here. Skipping work. You guys are. This is awesome. Any reason to skip work. (laughs) The drugs are kicking in. Excuse us. So I think we should start like every Google meeting just like that. Like, that would be freaking awesome. So thank you guys for being here. Um, We are excited to be able to have you know, the cast of a show that's being shot, you know, that's based on Uptown Chicago, Mm -hmm. and uh, having you guys here. (laughs) A handful of questions that anybody, any of you can answer. I mean, I'm excited because uh, I actually used to live in Uptown, which any of you guys have lived in Uptown, you know how challenging that can be still to this day. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Uptown has what? You've got your somewhat disenfranchised, you've got uh, lots of different kinds of people living there. You've got lots of different opportunities for improvement. Just say minorities. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing. You've got minorities. You've got everything. So <laughs> what, what do you want the folks in Uptown, like how are they served by your show, and like what things would you say to them if they were here? Just curious. I, I, if I can go, uh, I think we, uh, we, our cast is very mixed. So we cover, we're pretty much, that's what Uptown looks like. Every type of person represented, you know, uh, African Americans, white. He, uh, he's Middle Eastern. I am, uh, yeah. da- uh, the, the other guy. Oh, Mas, yeah. Diane Guerrero. She's uh, <laughs> she's she's Colombian. Judge character is Jewish. So um, we pretty much um, we cover every base pretty much for diverse show. So it represents the real uptown of Chicago. Very nice. So we always talk about here at Google unconscious bias, right? And it's something that we all obviously have, whether we're aware of it or not. Funny, funny enough. So can you kind of share with us, kind of? as you guys approach maybe even some of the shows, how they're structured, how they're written, how you're kind of tackling that? We did a whole show on that, didn't we? Yeah, we actually yeah. did. Yeah. Conscious bias. Well, was uh, that last year or was that this year? Last season. Right. This season was microaggression. Right. Sort of. Well, which one was the unconscious bias one? Um, we don't watch our show often. Was it the one where you had the hoodie on and you said, was it? I oh, am yeah, just yeah, a black yeah. man with a hoodie? Baseball yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did that last episode. Um, where people um, don't really know they might be doing some racist or you know prejudice, but it's just instilled in them that they've been conditioned to think that way. And that was the episode we did last year. This this season we uh, we touched on microaggression, and I'm pretty sure some people you know have been have, might have uh, experienced that, whether that be you know you know just you know I, work, I don't know if Google does. <laughs> that just makes me laugh. <laughs> hey Frank, anyway, it just makes me laugh. Google might do that. But like you know, I worked at uh, certain jobs, and uh, I've been asked certain things. Like uh, in this particular episode, Franco gets asked, you know, "Hey man, you, you know, you watched the basketball game last night? You know, uh, uh, Jimmy Butler had a terrible game. I need you to suit up." And you know, that was one line the guy said to me. I'm like, "Hey, look, I don't really watch basketball." And the guy's like, "You really?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Man, fuck you, man." <laughs> I, I I used to get that a lot. I kind of still get that shit, man. This just makes me. It, it, it annoys me the most. You basketball know? or boxing, I'm assuming. I like boxing. You follow boxing? boxing, boxing yeah. Boxing's cool. Do you, well, watch, do you watch basketball? I actually follow both. Um, so I don't no, care. I like skateboard. I actually like X Games, man. Do you watch X Games? I like X Games a lot. Really? How often do they do that? <laughs> <laughs> He's doing it. Y'all see what? How, how, how often? Is that a four year thing or is that every X-Games? year? X Games. X Games every year. Okay. It's not like the Olympics or anything. Well, every they year, call it the Games, I thought maybe. Nah, it's oh. just, uh, you know. Uh, but we what did that this year. I'm, I'm Middle Eastern and I watch soccer. It was soccer. about unconscious bias. Okay. So I, I fit the, I, fit, I, fit, I mean, Middle Eastern people like uh, soccer. I'm white and I love guns. There you go. <laughs> guns and limiting, limiting other people's liberty. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't even pronounce liberty. That's how, that's how white he 
<laughs> limiting, limiting. <laughs> and he's being served by Mueller today, later. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Awesome. They have an indictment on us. That's awesome. <laughs> so it's interesting that you talk about stereotypes because, you know, oftentimes African Americans are always seen as, well, you know, you back in the day you say, well, you can tap dance, right? You can dance, you can play ball, you can do this. And you guys are comedians, which is also an area where there's lots of African Americans. So how do you play, how do you, how do you kind of toe the line between being able to share your message and not being kind of stereotyped yourselves? You gotta be honest with yourself, man. If you like, if you like things, you like certain things, like your things you like. It's funny, I grew up in, uh, in D.C., all black, like, neighborhood, some, some Hispanic, and uh, I remember, like, you know, I was, I just always skateboarding around town, and I was really into, like, filmmaking and uh, shit that was just, like, wasn't, you know, relative to, you know, my family growing up. You know, we, you know, my family loved boxing and basketball and stuff, so I got called a white boy a lot. Mm. Did you really? You know, I did. So would you say Oreo? Uh, Oreo. I got Oreo sure. sometimes. Um, you know, and I hated that because, like, you can, the more, I f it's so weird because I feel like the more you're so, like, you're trying to be, you know, the, the more you try to cater to other people, the more you lose, you, know, you lose less of who you want to be and who you, who you are. So I never really cared about what people thought about me. So the more you think about you becoming a stereotype or you not being a stereotype, it's just going to eat you up and really make you, it's just... It'll it'll like it'll just ruin your day. It just I think exhausts. the show I think the show also has a good uh, representation along you know from from liberal to conservative and different colors in the show actually. So I play an Arab American in there. I play an Iraqi American who is conservative and a Trump supporter. So you have that, and then you've got the young African American guy who's very liberal and then you got, you know, disenfranchised yeah. blue collar white guy. Yeah, and then you got the older Jewish guy. So you got every person, you got the female, you got the now the young Latina female and then you've got the older uh, female who's been in the neighborhood and she's tough and she comes from an Italian family. So we 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 you know, everybody's covered. Yeah. So we get to bring out a subject, any subject and give all these different points of view on it. Which is awesome because you're really not even Iraqi. Are you? You're I'm Iranian. Iranian, right? Iranian, right? Yeah, That's yeah. Awesome. I wanted them to do an Iranian character, but they wanted someone from a war-torn country, and I said, "Well, Iran was in a war with Iraq," uh, but then they said, "We think that the general public might not remember that war, <laughs> uh, at least in America." And I said, "All right." I said, "Okay." Too late. It wasn't covered. It's a shame. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a, it, it's a shame. That was a but, you know how war. they say Americans. We don't really pay attention to the rest of the world, really. So uh, we, didn't, we didn't cover the 1953 CIA coup. We did not cover that coup. And Very also, well. by the way, we weren't in, we weren't at war with Iran. If we'd been in war with Iran, maybe the Iranian character would have worked out. But then again, we may be going to war with Iran. So maybe the guy will become Iranian in the next oh. couple seasons <laughs> if if Trump keeps. We'll going. We'll find an Iraqi to play him. We will get an Iraqi to play him. That's how it goes. It's the balance right there. Uh, uh, so how would you respond to some of the pushback on how realistic you think the show is? So, I mean, is, it, wait, first, is there pushback? Is there pushback? <laughs> what? what happened? And I is mean, it supposed to be realistic? I mean, is it, it's not a documentary. <laughs> it's, it's a sitcom. Yeah, we have I mean, fun. True was enough. Cheers really a bar owned by a baseball player that, you know, you know, I don't... It shot Cheers it a lot in L.A. That's as much as, much real as it can that get. That wasn't okay. Boston? All right, well, that's perfect, because a lot of times people say that in Chicago, you know, it's very, very segregated. So the chances of actually having all of those different groups represented um, consistently anywhere is, is very, very slim. So it, it's interesting that you have a platform for say, showing how that could come together, but I just wonder what, what comments. That's kind of like, that's, that's like a, the reverse criticism of, of, of uh, Friends, which was in New York, and everyone was like, they're all white. <laughs> and now we got a mixed group, they're like, they're too mixed. It's too mixed. <laughs> they tone that shit down, man. Like, Mexicans <laughs> don't eat donuts, get yeah. out of here. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, this is, a, this is a shop in an area that's being gentrified that still yeah. has people from you know the old, Neighborhood are still there, sure. so it's it, it's a it's kind of yeah, a crossroads. Gentrification plays a huge part in the show. You know, we always talk about it. that's one thing we can all agree on. This neighborhood is changing, and it's funny because like I used to, I, I've done Zany's Comedy Club uh, down in uh, Old Town a bunch of times. And I just realized driving down here, uh, Dave told us that um, Caprini Green, Caprini Green, Caprini Green, Caprini Green, Caprini Green's was like uh, was a project. It's a mile it was. from there. Yeah, now a Target. It used to be this building, right? Um, I'm just playing. It wasn't Google, was it? No. Uh, but it was funny because like, I just realized it's Target now. Yep, targets everywhere. That's hilarious. Um, and yeah. Google isn't. <laughs> <laughs> just talked about targets. Like targets taking over everything. 
Oh, wait a minute. To find a target, you got to use Google <laughs> to find where they are. They're all offended. Hey, hey. We're just playing, That's not man. funny. <laughs> Target's the enemy, not Google. It's we big. love you guys. Give us stock, please. Playing. You guys are great. <laughs> They're going to change the algorithm of our names. <laughs> Y'all negative. Yeah, man. So, David, you spent a lot of time on the comedy scene here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Did that have anything to do with you taking the role or not taking the role or being more <laughs> excited about it because you could identify with it? Uh, probably a little bit more excited about it. In fact, I told the story before. I, what I saw was announced, because I don't know if you guys know this, but it's based on a play. Yep. Uh, Superior Donuts was a play uh, set here in Chicago and workshopped at the Mariachi Theater Company and then Steppenwolf Theater and then went, went to Broadway. And I saw it announced in the trades and for some reason I said to myself, I'm gonna be in that. Uh, just because I figured, I don't know, it's my turn. Uh, <laughs> but I just had a feeling, and sometimes you do, and, and then lo and behold, there it was. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. Now a lot of my friends auditioned for the part and didn't get it, so they're not very happy. <laughs> the real authentic Chicagoans didn't actually get it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so yeah, that, that's a lot of fun. That's cool. Yeah. So I mean, you've got family. You're out in California, you're, and I heard you guys have a grueling, just like schedule. How do you balance all of that? Like, oh, we that's don't. a lot. With intention, I mean, okay. you with to, Shauna. You, yeah, I, I with don't. Shauna. Shauna's our publicist right there. He's a sweet. But you're player. talking about work in general, in general right? Oh. I mean, that's something that a lot of times I'm asking it very deliberately. Yeah. A lot of times, you know, and we like this is unplugged a little bit. Women always get asked that, right? We always say, "Well, you got kids, you got this. How are you balancing it all?" But I think that a lot of times people don't realize that you know men have to balance that too. So, right. uh, well, the just good news to know is, how you do all that. Good news is that our schedule is actually uh, to work in a multicam. Um, you're actually working less than 30 hours a week. Oh. No, no, it's, it's close to 40. It is. I did the math. Okay. Yeah. I thought I thought it was less than 30 until I stopped seeing my kids on Monday and Tuesday, oh, and I was like, yeah. oh, that's because we're shooting all but day. For instance, yeah. Wednesday is when our work week starts with our table read. We get there at 10, and we're out at 2. Oh. That's a pretty good day. Yeah, yeah, no, this is good. That's and that goes on for three days in a row. You're absolutely right. And then we have one, sometimes Mondays are 10 hours. Yeah. And sometimes uh, Tuesdays are 10 hours. 10 yeah. to 12. Both of those. Yeah. All the cam hours a little easier. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, yeah, I, I agree with you. They're still, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 I, every day I can take my kids to school. Oh, well, that's, that's huge. Done. You know? And uh, this show happens to shoot 10 minutes from my house. Oh, perfect. So it's perfect for me. Okay. Yeah. So that's, it's easy to put all that together. Yeah, but, but in general, I think you have to have the intention that I'm going to be there for my kids okay. as much as I can be or be available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice. I can appreciate that. So... You guys have a show premiering tonight. Mm -hmm. Coming out, it's yeah. going to be on tonight at 8 o'clock Central Standard Time, yeah. 9 o'clock Eastern Time. What do you want us to know about that? What do you want us to know about this season? How is it different? <laughs> I'd say, uh, well, the first season's always just an introductory season. You know, you're just trying to relay information for the new viewers and the viewers in the first season. It's just a lot of regurgitation. It's, you know, it just kind of gets a little uh, repetitious, you know. Yeah, you, you just, you're really establishing t for the audience the primary relationship of the show that people buy into and the peripheral characters you're exploring less so because week to week like no no these this is the primary relationship focus on focus on this and i know you guys did have a lot of that same like oh, hey wow. wait a minute hey wait a minute yeah but in the second so, season yeah. we're really just kind of letting everything breathe and we get to open all the characters up a little more we get to explain why Maz, you know you know thinks the way he does or you know where dave's coming from and you know it's introducing cool. a new character yeah Diane tell Guerrero. us about that and her organic uh Truck. Food truck. Oh, yeah. So Diane Guerrero, she's in uh, Orange is the New Black. Uh, she plays uh, Sophia, and she owns this uh, organic or organic uh, food truck. And it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's, it's a threat to Arthur's uh, business. And so they get into it. But deep down, Arthur sort of respects her because he has, she has this work ethic that you know, he can get behind. That's awesome. We can't wait to see that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we're all huge fans of donuts and of all things organic. So uh, I think it hits two really great areas What's for What's your us. favorite donut, though? My fa so my favorite donut. Yes, and didn't everybody ask you guys that? So I like right. glaze. I gave it to you. Remember? I'm old fashioned. Like I like the old fashioned glaze. Just give it to me straight and easy. I'm the like, same way. Real simple stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly the superior donuts. And I know as the executive producer, you're the actor, and so you also have some say in like you know what 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 happens. Um, or I assume so. So clearly it's a platform for dealing with lots of social issues. I, I know that you mentioned the one where you were with, 
talking about the hoodie and you're with all cops and you weren't sure like if that was the right time to be talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of different episodes, you know, there was one where they thought that perhaps, you know, you took one of the pieces of art or something that was on the wall or some kind of a, uh, a sports memorabilia that was on the wall. Same episode, right? The baseball, Same, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Arthur's uh, uh, home run baseball he got. Yeah, I remember that one. So, Comedy and sitcoms have often been used as a platform for addressing social issues. How is Superior Donuts any different? Well, I'll tell you this. I'm from. I've done stand up about ten years, and you know, that's. Uh, I'm used to taking things from news headlines and going on stage and yapping about it. So it was pretty easy to go from that to doing Superior Donuts because that's exactly what we're basically doing. You know, it. Uh, we we bring up in the writers' room. We bring up these issues. Uh, 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 as uh, potential topics to talk about in, in, in episodes. And all I have to do in there is uh, give them my, my experiences dealing with these uh, particular issues. Say, you know, we were talking about the, um, uh, uh, the, so, the unconscious bias episode where the cop was following me around. And, you know, I'm like, hey, you know, one time that happened to me. A friend of mine, I watched a friend of mine get his ass beat by a cop back in Maryland, and uh, it was pretty, the first time I've ever seen that, it really changed every, the way I looked at police officers. So I tell them these stories, and what happens is uh, they sort of include them in certain, you know, parts and scenes. And as an actor, it help it motivates me to get get certain areas to get emotional, or because I really do get emotional when I do these scenes, especially when I'm doing it with Judd, because Judd is masterful, you know. But uh, those 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 topics are just some you're supposed to talk about, and especially in a show like this where it takes place in a gentrifying area where everyone's sort of like, it's clashing, you know what I mean? And you've got to talk about it. I think we do a pretty good job of not making the decision for the audience either. We bring up, you know, other sides of an argument or an idea or a uh, cultural difference, and, uh, but we don't, make, we don't make a resolution for everybody, which I think is probably more satisfying for an audience that we're not preaching to them. So we're all, like most Americans, there are two sides to look at. And so I think we do a pretty good job of, doing, of bringing up both sides. And the writers, you know, we, <clears throat> early on last season, there was an article written in the New York Times, and I've, I've been in, you know, there's been several articles like this throughout, like for the depiction of Arab Americans, Iranian Americans, Middle Eastern Americans, Muslim Americans in film and television, and how negative those depictions are. I remember I got that article and I, and I took it to the writers, and Bob Daly, who's the showrunner, said, oh, I, I already saw this, and I've already spread it out amongst all the writers. Uh, so that was good for me to hear. <laughs> and um, so one of the things they try to do, and I've, and I've encouraged them to when they write, um, and, and, and I get happy when they do, is they don't necessarily just base the jokes on your background or your ethnicity. And just because you're of a certain ethnicity doesn't mean that you're gonna think a certain way. Not gonna be a stereotype. So, that, so that's kind of cool when they have yeah. something like, again, you know, if the guy's a jerk, he's just a jerk, whether he's Arab or, or not, or <coughs> white or black or whatever. And if he's cool, he's just cool. And in the end, though, in the end, because I play kind of the, um, the nemesis, per, you know, the most, you know, the guy who's, who kind of wants to buy the donut shop from uh, Judd Hirsch's character. <laughs> but in the end, it becomes a situation where we're all, we, in, in the end, there are, there, are, there are episodes where we all have each other's back. So it, it is a community, even if there's some of that stuff happening. That's cool. Really, I guess, so, you know, you're asking the difference. Our show, Lily, is a cultural, <laughs> a cultural barometer. <laughs> every, listen, every press stop we go to, Dave, boom, it's the culture barometer. He's trying it's to, true, he's, folks. He's, he's made really, t-shirts. It's, it's an important, it's the truth. It's, it's <laughs> he's got cultural barometer t-shirts and hats. We are the new news. Selling we after. are the new news. Plus, you guys can all go, ooh. <laughs> We're self-important. <laughs> we like to pat ourselves in the back a lot. Speaking of self, um, Maz, I know that you've uh, spent some time on the NPR show. You've done a couple of TED Talks. Now you're doing this. Tell the us TED more Talks. about, which, love TED Talks. I ain't do a fucking TED Talk. I got two of them, man. Give me, send me the link. Man, you got to look me up. I will, man. <laughs> you IMDb me? I, I was fucking I am TED the cultural talk. barometer <laughs> of this show. I did not know that. Yeah. I, That's yeah. awesome. What, we, what was the question? The question was just like, how does this this show, this role, you know, how are you using it as a part of like your overall uh, career or another sounding board or just, you know, in relation to some of those other things you do, how does this 
How does this relate? Well, it's all, you know, it's, the beauty of it is we are doing what we love doing, and as I'm sure a lot of you guys are. You know, um, my parents, being immigrant parents, wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor, um, and I did not go that path. I became an actor, and in that, and in that I've been able to do acting and stand-up comedy and Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, which is a radio show, and the TED Talks, which is me presenting, in, you know, things. Uh, so um, they're all, it's, it's all part of it part of the same thing and I try to, the underlying theme of a lot of stuff that I do is uh, I, I try to represent myself in a good way, in a positive way, in a different way. Um, as we know there's a lot of negative stereotypes of people from Middle Eastern backgrounds and, uh, and there's a big push, an anti-immigrant push in this country currently. <laughs> I mean some guy in, in Kansas shot two Indian dudes, uh, killed one and then told somebody that he should shot to Iranians. He got the wrong people, first of all. They hadn't done anything, they were just at a bar. And this guy was just some crazy dude, and this kind of stuff's happening. So my hope in the long run is that the more we get uh, uh, people of different backgrounds in the media, the more people can judge for themselves and see and go, oh wow, these people are just, you know, they're, they're, they're ordinary people. Like when I, did, when I did my first stand-up special, which was the Axie Comedy Special, one of the comments we got was, because it wasn't just, four comedians of Middle Eastern American backgrounds performing, there was Middle Easterners in the audience. And we got some emails saying, wow, I didn't know you people laughed. And it was true, you don't see our people laughing in a anywhere, on, except, on like, except like an evil like, right. whoa, you know, you know. <laughs> I will kill you in the name of Allah. You know? There it is, <laughs> that, that, yeah. That they've seen, but they've never <laughs> seen a guy just be like, ha ah, ha and that's another reason why I like this character. <laughs> As much as this character is, like I said, again, like says a lot of like Messing inappropriate up. stuff, uh, he says they give they give me some funny lines to say. So end of the day, if people are watching it and going like, "Oh, that dude made me laugh," and he's got an accent and he seems like he's from an Arab country, yeah. well, you know that'd be great. If people like that character, then yeah. that's one little. You, you in also the right come direction. from a conservative, like you have a conservative viewpoint. Yeah, so it's like, a conservative this, viewpoint, the, it's his character. Yeah, yeah so the, the Iraqi guy on our show. show has a conservative viewpoint, and it's so funny because he basically thinks the way most <laughs> Americans might think, you know, so they might see some similarities in this guy, and it's just so cool that it comes from a, a Middle Eastern fellow. And a real place. And a real place. And a real place. <laughs> With Maz. I'm definitely very conservative. <laughs> no. That's actually fun for me, too. I, I get yeah. to play a character that's very different than who I am, so we get to kind of, I get to lampoon it on a weekly basis. Kekner, yours is very close to you. Yes. <laughs> Disenfranchised, <laughs> middle aged white guy. <laughs> Let's talk about the set, right? So we, uh, here at Google, we're always talking about <clears throat> kind of being authentic, being yourself. You guys clearly are very authentic. You started very authentic. You are. Um, but I, I'd love to know, you know, kind of how that parlays into how you interact in the set. And I'm actually going to direct this question to Rel, because you're right next to me. Okay. Um, you know, I know that you wrote a show for Comedy Central, and you know you've had that experience, and obviously several stand-up comedy experiences. You know, for yourself, when you go into into work, and it's like, okay, it's showtime. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of bring your authentic uniqueness to your role? Well, my character's name is Sweatpants, and uh, <laughs> I got a cousin named Lil Pookie. <laughs> <laughs> it's not far. No, uh, it's well. What it is is I get to be. I don't have to. I probably have the easiest job of everybody. Um, because I know a thousand, you know, just cool dudes who just smoke a lot of pot and, and living off of their best friend, you know. I was that guy, in, I went to the University of Maryland. Any Terps? Just me? Cool. You a Terp? Hell yeah. Are you um, serious? Yo. What up, man? So, uh, Jermaine didn't, didn't go to college. I so, um... I went to school. I went to, uh, I, did, I worked around there at the dry cleaner. <laughs> he's, dry cleaner. In, 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 in real he's life, in real life, he's sweatpants and you're Franco. <laughs> He was sleeping in your <laughs> But you know, um, I, I get to just be, you know, I got the I got the cool job just coming in and saying something funny and getting out. I get to be as free and loose and as goofy as I wanna be and just, you know, kinda of be a slacker and uh so it's it's not hard for any kid that was smoking a lot of weed back in college. So I have the easiest of the jobs and uh so, you know, but that person's represented in every city, you know, any good friend, you know what I mean? My job is to be loyal to Franco's character and uh, I'm thinking I'm a pretty loyal friend. So I, I got the easiest, I think I got the easiest job. You, you do. Probably much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. chill. Cool. David, what about you? Uh, yeah, yes. Same questions. But just what was the exact All question? right. The question was, you know, how can you bring... Can you restate the question, please? <laughs> <laughs> how do you bring <laughs> your uniqueness to your role? Uh, 
I guess because I've been doing this for 30 years, uh, <laughs> there's only one way I know how to do it. So that's no. I, I was fortunate enough to to um, just get hired, and so okay. uh, they, uh, you know, were allowed me to find certain quirks and mannerisms in the character that reflected my personality, and uh, you know, I think I'm a good enough actor to understand what they needed from me script-wise too, so I would say that's it. Mostly just experience, you know? Cool. Yeah. What about you, Jermaine? Um, <clears throat> it's funny, I got a cousin named Pookie too. Everybody's got a cousin. Yeah, everybody Pookie. Pookie. Everybody's got a cousin named Pookie. Everybody's got a cousin named Pookie. This ain't for everybody, just for us three. <laughs> <laughs> everybody. I don't have a cousin. Pookie, Pookie. I, I, do, I don't have a cousin named Pookie. <laughs> <laughs> I do not. <laughs> Puya, uh, Puya, Puya. Most African Americans have a Pookie somewhere yeah. in the line. Why Pookie? What? I don't know. What is it? It's like it's like Dave for everybody else. It's like I uh, Oh, so he's a cool guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Dave's cool. <laughs> Kevin Hart's business manager's name is Pookie. Yes, he is. He had the same business manager. His name's Pookie. Pookie. Yeah. Um, I uh, I just it sounds bad, but he's really good. <laughs> Pookie smart. Um, what was funny is like uh, when I first got the job, I was extremely nervous. It was my first multicam sitcom role, and uh, I was like, all right, just copy Katie and Judge. Just copy Katie and Judge. Maybe tell us what multicam sitcom means. Uh, a Maybe bunch of cameras in a live studio audience setting. Four, four cameras in front of a live studio. Yeah, excuse okay. me if I didn't, it wasn't clear. Office is single cam. We all yeah. used to watch the office. Uh, Master of None, Cheers. Uh, single cam, Master of None, you know, and you got Cheers, multicam. There we go. Um, I was nervous, and uh, I realized, uh, all right, cool. Um, what's what, what what similarities do I have with the character and myself? Uh, I used to be broke, you know, looking for a job around Maryland. Um, I mean, I, I used that that desperation for the pilot, and as the season went on, we used different um, subject matter and different you know storylines. I always try to find similarities within the plots and uh, the scenes that I could relate to, and I always brought that to the to the uh, to the scenes. But Judd and Katie, man, uh, I really just watched the hell out of them. I just shut when they talk, I shut the hell up. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And Miles, what about yourself? I think you've kind of answered it, but I didn't want to. Neglect you in, in, in the question. No, no, you don't. You go you ask your next question because I think right. I did answer it, cool. right? Yeah. <laughs> no, the next I'm, season I'm is coming being out. Being efficient. <laughs> the next season is coming out. What, what, what do you want us as kind of Googlers to? And Googlers is the term we use for ourselves internally. Ooh. Yeah. You guys are on the Googlers. inside now. Yeah. Googlers. Googlers. Uh, what, what, what messaging do you want us as Googlers to know, and, and what would you encourage us to, I mean, obviously look at the show, but what should we know about this next season coming out? We just want you to live tweet it during the show. That'd be, good. That'd be really cool. <laughs> no, it's, it's a fun, listen, it, it, we're all, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of all the serialized shows that are out there, so, you know, the Game of Thrones and the House of Cards and all those shows. Rick and Morty. Um, but uh, this is a show that's not serialized. It's a show that you can tune in. Watch a few episodes and then you know skip to the next whatever. You can, you can watch it while you watch. Jump around. Dishes. So yeah. it's uh, and it's and and I think I, I honestly feel the writers have done a great job this season of doing some really funny stuff. There was scripts that I read before we did the table read, and I was laughing out loud. So there was some good funny stuff in there. So it's it's a good way to get some light entertainment while we touch on some serious subjects, but in a light way. And uh, hey, everybody needs to laugh. I mean, the world is crazier than ever. Uh, so once you've been bombarded with your daily news about Trump and Russia and Korea and wherever else, we're gonna, you know, tune into us and laugh a little bit. Is it too much to say we're we're here to unburden you of your pain? <laughs> Social barometer? What was it? What Social, was word? Uh, cultural. cultural barometer. Cultural barometer. Katie Seagal plays a cop, and you know she's awesome. Judd Hirsch is cooking donuts. Watch the damn show. Uh, it's going to be really good. Very cool. We're super excited that you took some time. We know this has been a super long day for you, so thank you for coming here to talk to yeah. us. Uh, and it's not just obviously this audience, but a lot of people are are, are going to be seeing this throughout Google. So we just really appreciate you guys are are. are Hilarious, oh, and you, it's awesome to hear that you guys are going to be at Zany's tonight because it sounds like that's going to be a really good time. Yeah, yes. thank um, you. So sold out, so that sucks. But y'all can, um, I guess, come afterwards and 
<laughs> just Google us <laughs> and <high>. for the <laughs> next time. <laughs> you you want to see us live, just Google us and, and you'll yeah, see us <laughs> next time. Or Bing. Bing is pretty hot. You know? What? No, remember Bing? Who? That's a curse word here. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm fucking around. All right, okay. <laughs> what happened to Bing? Did y'all kill Bing? Of course they killed Bing. <laughs> and Google. <laughs> I was auditioned for a Bing commercial back in like 2000. <laughs> like that. Bing like, bombed. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> Bing bomb. So I heard it. And done. We are going to give the audience an opportunity to ask a few questions. Uh, I know I've been dominating here, but that's what I was supposed to do. So uh, if anybody has questions, just because this is being recorded, we would like for you to go to the microphone in the middle. Don't all jump at the same time, guys. We already did it. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this thing is. Oh, here we yeah, go. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Uh, hey. My question is actually for Lila. Where did you get those googly sneakers from? Uh, you know what? I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> those Pumas? Like my sisters would love those. Uh, Nordstrom. What? Yeah. Are those Sacones? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can say the brand, but uh, oh, yeah. They're Bings. <laughs> <laughs> You're so awesome. What's up, buddy? Hey, quick question. Uh, so, being comedians on a comedy show, you know, and having written your own stuff in the past, do you guys ever find yourself funnier than the writers? And then do you guys get input yes. into All really the time. recrafting stuff? <laughs> yes. I, I, as a stand-up I comic, I, I plead, hate. I plead the fifth. Oh, come on, real. <laughs> I honestly do sometimes. Because, you know, you're a comic. You're reading the stuff, you know, for years. Then, you know, I just, I, I'm very selfish sometimes when it comes to my, you know, my comedy. I just want to make sure, like, whatever I'm saying is going to be funny. But you, you just want to, like, you know, have some sort of... Con Control over, over what are you saying, but like you know, they do a good job. Honestly, they're really, we all, really. Fun. We all want to lift the material any way we can, if we can. You know, yeah. we always want to do the best job possible, have the best show on yeah. TV. That's because we're just stand-ups. You know yeah. what I mean? We're not, you know. And it's like having four extra writers, really. When you really think about it. So now we get to keep our stuff. That's a different story. Mm. You know what I'm saying? They allow us on show night to maybe do a take with some of the ideas we have. As Crazy well. take, fun. But take. they, but there's a lot of good writers, so they come up with even show night. They come up with alternative ideas. Uh, yeah. It's 14 writers, line, yeah. and they all, it all gets filtered. It's a very collaborative show. Everybody wants the show to be good, and as long as it's, it gets that way, then we're just fine. Mm -hmm. As hell. The yeah. format lends itself to a certain style of comedy that you know, we all know we're in for. So, Are they going to watch this? Never no, mind. Think, nope. <laughs> they might stumble upon it. We didn't say anything bad. Never mind. Nope. I'm Did you just say never mind? Never mind. Did you uh, yeah. off the ER? It's and after okay. one. <laughs> after one. <laughs> I know you guys have been in the stand-up comedy game for a long time, and it's a long road to get where you guys are now today. So I was wondering if one of you could share a story of the early days of when you were starting up, oh, any like good. bad gigs you had, or memorable, <laughs> bizarre uh, experiences starting out on the road. Oh, man. Uh, There's all kinds of them, man. Because we, we, the, the thing is, when you first start out, you gig in everywhere you can. Coffee shops, uh, you know, bars. Uh, church basements. I did a church basement where there was uh, eight people in the audience, and then I realized they were all there to perform, so we would just rotate. <laughs> <laughs> we would rotate. You'd finish, you'd sit, the next guy would come up, and you, and you, felt, you felt bad leaving, because you're like, oh, well, he yeah, watched mine, watch I'll mine. watch his. I did, a, uh, I did a country club, and just a bunch of old white dudes, man, and I, my comedy ain't for them. So I did it, and I bombed so bad. I told the booker, keep the money. I needed the money for rent. And he was like, OK. And so he agreed with <laughs> he you. He agreed with me. He kept the money, man. <laughs> I started in uh, sketch and improv, so there's plenty of nights where you have a, a small audience or some people who just aren't down with it. Uh, the worst one being uh, Mayfield Park, the racetrack. We did a show there. I mean, the, the stage was bad, the lights were bad, the crowd was worse. But you don't blame the audience, you know. You gotta, you've got to find out where their funny bone is and tickle it, so not their fault. But th those are always a tough one. But at least I had other people with me. <laughs> I, did a, uh, I did a gong show at the comedy store one time. I don't know why I did that. And this is like, face remember Facebook was just like a college thing? And it wasn't like the general public didn't have it. Well, nobody told me, right? So I'm on, I'm on this gong show. I do this joke. You know, ladies, it was real hacky. Ladies, if I send you a friend's request on Facebook and you accept, we together. Like, that was the, that was the punch. That was the hit, right? right? And Facebook, and this, this was killing in college, right? And I do this show, and Facebook hadn't came out at that time. And it was just like, <laughs> what is, what's Facebook? And, they said, and I heard from the back, somebody says, 
next comedian. <laughs> and it was the bouncer of the comedy club saying that. <laughs> So I stopped doing comedy for six months. Oh. <laughs> That's why you took the six months. Uh. You know, that leads me to a, a, probably a very obvious question around failure, right? So many people. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, OK. Sorry. Um, I didn't see kind of related. My friend who is sitting next to me is um, an up and coming stand up comedian here in Chicago. Um, she had to leave for a meeting. She oh. wanted to know. Um, why is she up there telling us? <laughs> she had to leave for a oh, oh, okay. very important meeting. OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any advice for specifically women coming up in comedy right now? Oh, just oh. get up on stage as much as you can and write as much as you can. I mean, yeah. for a man, woman, what child, well, child, you probably should be home doing your homework. But <laughs> just get up and write as much as you can. That's it. Go, 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 go. You figure it out. Mulaney gave me some advice when I first started. I used to, <laughs> MySpace was big. Uh, I, MySpace, Mulaney. Hey, man, you're from Georgetown. I live in D.C. Uh, uh, what, what do I, uh, how, do I how, how do I get big or whatever? And uh, he's like, well, you know, if you're, not, um, if you're not writing, get on stage. If you're not on stage, make sure you write. And it was the most simple like, concept. And I was like, oh, and it's one thing you just people forget. It's just, just write and get on stage. You know, fail. You got to fail. The, the more you experience uh, success early on, the more, uh, when, when, when success hits, uh, when, when failure hits you, you're not gonna be ready for it. You, it's just gonna hit you really hard. So bomb as much as you can, find yourself early, so when those, when those opportunities come your way, you'll know how <coughs> to deal with it. Bless Excuse you. Excuse me. You're welcome. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, and uh, that's, that's my advice. Okay. Yeah, um, between networks and Netflix and Hulu, do you guys think that there's too much TV and video content right now? I, I, yeah. actually, I actually think there's, I think stand-up is really oversaturated, personally. Don't like it. I think it's too much. At the same time, all of, we can all work way more. I just think as a fan, I'm like, oh, this, a lot of this is watered down, and it's very hard to find, I think, quality stuff. You know, as, a, as an actor, as a comedian, great. Keep giving us money. Yeah. So if I wasn't a comedian, I would be like, oh, this, this is kind of I don't know what you guys think. I can't tell from that perspective. But to me, I think it is a lot. Every, every, it's weird, because like, uh, every big movie comes out, uh, like, Twice, two, like just probably like a movie that comes out like a good one comes out like twice a month, and Netflix puts out a special once every like every Tuesday or so. A Netflix movie every freaking Tuesday. and special. It's it's yeah. like gets a little too much because you can't really keep up, and that just kind of oversaturates the market. You can't really like really enjoy one or really like, you know, uh, find your guy or the one you you know want to watch when like you, you you know one in your queue gets flushed over because another one's popped up and it's it's a lot. It's a lot of stand-up comedy. I just yeah. start watching Curb. I'm never gonna get the Stranger Things. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm stuck. What am I supposed to do? It's a lot, but it's also a blessing because you know a lot of opportunities for comics are are happening, and uh, people can finally. You know, there there isn't just comedy. When I was starting, it was just Comedy Central, and um, I don't think Netflix is out. HBO. No, nah, it was just Comedy Central, and they were like the gatekeepers. And now a lot of people working at Comedy Central work at Netflix, so yeah. it's pretty cool to watch that happen. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, it does it's take the power away from certain people. It does, and I'm very happy about that. Yeah, so it that democratizes was the problem. it. It really does. You guys don't know what it's like not to have power, but yeah. everybody, other networks, <laughs> take the yeah. power away from like a Comedy Central. Yeah, like that. Hulu, CISO are getting in on it, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, it's pretty cool, remarkable to see all that. But the problem is now there's a lot of specials, so it's your job to find the ones you like. You know what I mean? But it, it, all, all that takes is going to live comedy shows and supporting, seeing the person you like, and really just following their career. Um, so I used to work with John Montgomery at Leo Burnett when he would mm -hmm. carry oh. around a suitcase mm -hmm. full of ideas for TV shows. Oh. And he was one of John my favorite Montgomery's people to work producer. with. I'm just curious how you guys look like working with John. Oh, and John's dope. <laughs> John's for, those, for the rest of them that don't know, John Montgomery is one of our exec, one of our exec producers as well as uh, Native Chicago uh, guy. Yeah, Mark Teitelbaum, these two guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, well, your question, I mean, we love him. He's such a sweetheart. And and. These two were the ones who found the project in the first place from Tracy yeah. Letts, right? John, John is a John, friend of Tracy's, yeah. John and Mark Teitelbaum over there. John's the guy who looks like Harold Ramis in the back right there. <laughs> and Mark's right there sitting alone with the black jacket. So we're, we're grateful for John, because yeah. if not for him, this show wouldn't exist. And I'll tell you why, why, how great he's working with John. Uh, I, had a, I was dating a girl at the time, and I brought her to the set. She was so bored doing the taping. And John was like, you know what you need? Some magic tricks. Oh, John knows the cars, magic. <laughs> give it to her, clap out out. Like she was happy for the rest of the day. It was funny. You know? like, one of Why the, would I not want that as a producer? You uh, know? Uh, one, of, one, of, one of the writers on the show is afraid of magic, and she's afraid to tell John that. So John, every time you pull out your cars, she's like, 
She walks away because she can't handle the magic. I'm saying. She goes, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. You bring your girl to set. Take over to John. John's awesome. Yeah, John, John's a good dude. Yeah, he he's, a, he's a great tour guy, too, in Chicago. Yeah. So one of the questions I was going to ask earlier, um, you know, you mentioned, hey, get up there, fail as much as you can. You know, oftentimes people talk about, hey, failure, have as many at bats, or you know, uh, swing it out as many times as you can. But even though that's true, most people avoid it like the plague. And so the question is, clearly, with what all of you do, you're dealing with failure right on all the time, right? People either like you or they don't. Yeah. The question is, how do you rebound? Right? I mean, how do you, there's had, there has to have had been times when you didn't eat, deal with it so easily. Or maybe you deal with failure really well as a stand-up comedian or as an actor, but you don't deal with it so well in other areas of your life. So kind of what have you done to be successful to manage that? Well, that's why you got to find what you love. And that's why, again, I think you guys are probably in a field, I hope you're in the field that you love. You know, the, all the stories you hear about uh, um, Bill Gates being in that garage for so long or any of these guys who founded these companies just going and going and going. I personally, I studied poli-sci undergrad. I started a PhD program in poli-sci. I dropped out. Throughout my early 20s, I tried my hand at different jobs, and I wasn't passionate about them. So when I wouldn't do well at them, I'd be like, you know what, I quit. But this, finally when I found this, there was, it, it, it wasn't, even though it was a bad night, it wasn't a failure. Um, it was like, okay, I'll come back again tomorrow because I really was passionate. I really loved it. I, I had to do it the next day. As a matter of fact, when I had a bad night, I couldn't wait to get back up to kind of almost get, it's like a baseball player probably wants to get that hit again. Yep. I wanted to just get up, get a hit, get a pretty good set, and be like, okay, I'm going to put that behind me. So the same way, I mean, I think if you really can find your passion, then your failures are just, it's just part of the road because you can't succeed 100% of the time. <laughs> Uh, if, and if you are, you're delusional. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's also great to, to have friends who do the same thing that you do, because I know as, comedian, as comedians, you know, we failed together. You know, I would come back like, oh, I mean, I just bombed at Laugh Factory, and my boy would be like, I bombed at the comedy store, and I got in a fight with one of the audience members. Like, oof, <laughs> your night was way worse than my shit. It's like, all right, so you know, you can always. Uh, this is one thing about the, com the comedy clubs. You can always hear a worse story that night. Somebody always had it worse. And I hate to say it, it makes you feel better. You know, one day you're gonna have that worst story, but every night I went and I was upset and bothered and frustrated, somebody always had it. We're like, man, they, like, they made my money only came half of the money. Well, I'm getting evicted tomorrow, bro, so I don't want, so it's like, okay, well, you know what, I'm gonna try tomorrow. We're gonna be good. And, you know, people's pain makes me feel better at the point. <laughs> at the point. Well, plus, you've already, you know, you have success somewhere. I mean, yeah. we, you know, people like to hear failure stories, but there's a lot of success, and so you just build on that. And I think a lot of it, too, is you make your decision, and that's, that's it. Uh, that, that will go your way, and you just keep that in your heart, like, I'm going to succeed. And then hopefully you're able to see enough success that, that you know, helps you build to your dream. Because yeah. I've known people, too, that, that hang in there for years, and you're just like... Yeah. No one has encouraged you once, and that's almost more admirable. People that have no success yet stay in it. Mm -hmm. But you know, ultimately, they'll usually opt out. But uh, yeah, I think you just, you've got to believe. Yeah. Like, you make that decision and you just go full, full head. I like once that. you get there, it's so sweet. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, this is Google. Like, it doesn't get better than this, I'm assuming, right? In the tech world. Okay, maybe it does. Never mind. You guys are looking at me. There's a lot of free water and free food. It's pretty good. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm probably reading about, I, I like the, when I was, you know, broke living in Washington Heights in New York, I was sleeping on his air mattress and I was sad. But like I was reading Steve Martin, I was read, I read Steve Martin's uh, bio mm -hmm. and uh, that like, it, it really just like opened my eyes a little bit about like, oh, you know, the struggle's real. Uh, and Hannibal's What the Fuck episode, Mark Maron's uh, podcast. Yeah, that was pretty good, yeah. When he slept on the train, I was like, me too, you know? And uh, you know, we hear similar stories like Rel was talking about. It really does, you know, help you realize, oh, hey, I'm not the only one going through this, you know? Um, I think Amy Poehler has a dope book about uh, her first moving to New York, and, you know, it's just like, it's a part of the, <laughs> it's a part of success is failure. All of it, probably you get most of failure before you get to the success, you know? Um, but that, once you get there, like like uh, like Rel said, it's really sweet. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, for the most part, I now that I'm here, I appreciate me failing so much because uh, 
those were the those are the best stories. Like you know, I go back home to uh, Brooklyn. And I talk to my old comedy buddies, and I talk to them about like times uh, we used to get wasted and like you know annoy people so much they would fight like each other. Like we didn't know how we did it, but you know we were just like you know we're just just mean comics, man. We were just like going through a lot at the time. And it was just great. Um, but having similar stories is very helpful when you're going through that type of stuff. That's awesome. By the way, a late congratulations to uh, having a beautiful baby girl. Yeah. Thank you, Lila. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. She's gorgeous. <laughs> she looks just like him. It's weird. My, my little dog looks like me, so that's unfortunate for her. Uh, but <laughs> she is so cool. Like, uh, she's getting taller. I think she might be taller than me uh, when she gets older, which is awesome. Uh, I, I don't know. There's, there are people always ask me, what's it like to be a dad? I don't like have a word for it. It's, it's awesome, it's beautiful, and she's like, ah, I can't wait to go back home and see her tomorrow, man. It's gonna be great. We're gonna dress her up as Chucky for Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> she can, she's the right size for the costume. <laughs> well, are there any other, yeah, we got yeah. another question. So uh, Chicago plays a big role in your show, obviously, um, and some of you have spent a lot of time in Chicago. Is there anything that you're super excited about to do, super excited to do while you're here or see or just? We want to go to Millennial Park and do social media pictures. Isn't that right, Shauna? Shauna. Uh, <laughs> hopefully it's going to be dark when we get out yeah, of here. Yeah, it might be a little too dark to do it. It's so exciting so to do social media pictures at Millennial Park. We, uh, we haven't had much time. We got in last night and we were all pretty exhausted because we've been traveling every day. And then today we had to get up at uh, 445 to leave the hotel at 5.15, so and it's been, uh, we did get some Giordano's pizza today. So we got Gio's and we feel like shit. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got that mistake. in. It was a mistake. I want to actually go to the Wiener Circle with Dave Keckner. Uh, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> I've never. <laughs> I want to go. Is that the one you give him 20 bucks for the milkshake? I'll take you out yeah. at the thing. Oh yeah, I've, I've been there, it's pretty I've funny. I've never been there. Well, yeah, it's just, yeah, to yeah. me, it's, yeah. That'd be, that'd be if, we, if we had another day, we'd okay. be able to. It's all good. Yeah. It's all good. But I, but I don't know. Like I've, I've been to the, to the be I actually wanted to do a Dark Knight tour because I'm a big ass nerd. So I want to try and do that. Actually, we went to the under the underpass. Where Laura the Joker. Drive. Jermaine is actually looking for Batman. Yeah. And we, he won't yeah. believe us. We're like, he's not real. Fuck <laughs> 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 you. <Yes>. you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a huge nerd. I'm going to try and do that, actually. So I'm going to go on Google and find we did a, landmarks. We, we did a segment at, at Second City today, so that was fun. That so was those cool. guys hadn't been there before. So, yeah. That was really cool. I did the Rock Tour in San Francisco. You ever did that? You mean of... Um, Sean Carter and Nicholas Cage. Oh, no. I didn't know there was one. <laughs> there wasn't. I just Googled the place. Oh. They, did, they shot the I'm movie. I'm going to Alcatraz. I've never been to Alcatraz, man. That it should have been first on the Rock Tour. But well, it wasn't. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> It was huge. It was a huge line to do it. I didn't have time. <laughs> we have another question. Yeah, just, uh, one more. Um, what were your favorite sitcoms, either growing up or just of all time? For Titus. The 20s? Mine was Cheers and Taxi. Yeah, Taxi. Um, I was an old. I liked Abbott and Costello's movies and uh, uh, Monty Python. SNL was big. SNL. Um, Marx Brothers. Uh, I'm done. As far as sitcoms, I mean, I'm from DC as well as Jermaine. So Martin, Martin was the world. Martin. Nothing. Martin was everything. I didn't care about nothing else but Martin. Martin. Um, <laughs> my early moments, and I, I never told Katie this, but I had the biggest crush on her because Married with Children was the show. I think we still do. Actually. Yeah. Monday. Married with Children. Uh, my dad and I used to watch that. Uh, All in the Family was really great. It's, I think it's similar. A lot of the issues that we talk about now, but but number one was I never I've never seen Seinfeld because it was on the same time as Martin. And as a comedian, that's like a sin. I'm like, I don't know what happened. Who's Kramer? Yeah, I, but, I know, but I know who Shanene was. Shanene. <laughs> you know? well, Does Ren and Stimpy count? Yeah. I used to watch that one. Yeah. I thought that was... Um... Shanene, Martin played Shanene. Oh, you he, know what? You didn't know that? He was over. Oh, that. You didn't know Martin played that hideous woman? No. That was Martin. Wow. Oh, we got to do a lot of work after this show. All we got to talk. Well, I I'd, love say, I'd say MASH, too, was, was big I'd for like, me as a kid. MASH came on at 4 in the morning when I was a kid, so I couldn't watch it. <laughs> that was yeah. came on really, really, really for some reason. The reruns for some reason. Uh, hey, Shanae Otis, the whistling. Dragonfly Jones. <laughs> you, you a class. I was a class of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been before my time. Um, anyway, any other, <laughs> or not, any other questions from the audience? They go ready, they're ready to go back and make flying cars now. They didn't think much. Well, I will say this. Considering the fact that you all were up at 445 or whatever, um, we are extremely grateful that you even 
passed by it and stopped to say hello to us and chat. Um, you guys are clearly very funny. I haven't laughed this much like this whole week, so of course we started. Um, so uh, thanks again, <laughs> and uh, good luck with the show. Thank I know I'm going to tune in. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank, Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Are they engineers or like marketers? What, 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 who are we talking to?